Chapter 27 of The Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase. Chapter 27 The Blossom Festival. Two hours sleep, bath, breakfast, and I started on my early morning run for the county seat. Nobody else was going my way. But even at that hour, the road was full of autos, buggies, farm wagons, pretty much everything that could run on wheels, headed for the festival all trimmed and streaming with the blossoming branches of their orchards. These were the country folks, coming in early to make a big day of it. Orchardists, ranchers from the cattle lands in the south end of the county, truck and vegetable farmers, flower-seed gardeners, the Japs and Chinese from their little, closely cultivated patches. This tide streamed past me on my left hand as I made my way to Worth and the jailer's office, trying with every mile I put behind me to bolster my courage. Why wasn't this shift of the enemy a blessing in disguise? Let their setting of the hour for the murder stick, and wouldn't Worth's alibi be better than any we should have been able to dig up for him before midnight? From time to time I was troubled by recollection of Barbara's crushed look from the moment they sprung it on us, but brushed that aside with the obvious explanation that her efforts in bringing Mrs. Bowman to speak out had just been of no use, surely enough to depress her. Worth met me, fit, quiet, not over-eager about anything. They let us talk with a guard outside the door. Once alone, he listened appreciatively while I told him of our interview with Cummings and Dykeman as fast as I could pile the words out. "'Nobody on earth like Bob's,' was his sole comment. "'Never was, never will be.' "'And now,' I reminded him nervously, "'there's the question of this alibi. You went straight from the restaurant to your room at the palace and to bed there?" No, he said slowly. No, I didn't. Well, well, I broke in. If you stopped on the way, you can remember where. The people you spoke to will be as good as the clerks and bellhops at the palace for your alibi. He sat silent, thoughtful, and I added, Where did you go from Tatesworth? To a garage, in the Tenderloin, where they keep good cars. I'd hired machines from them before. Oh, they knew you there? Then their testimony will— I don't believe you want it, Jerry. It only accounts for the half hour, or less, right after I left you. All I did was to hire a car. A car? I echoed vaguely. What kind of a car? Hired it for when? I asked them for the fastest thing they had in the shop told him to fill it all round and see that it was tuned up to the last notch. I wanted speed. My God, Worth, do you know what you're telling me? The truth, Jerry. His eye met mine unflinchingly. That's what you want, isn't it? Where did you go? I groaned. You must have seen somebody who could identify or remember you. Not a solitary human being to identify me. Those I passed— there were people out, of course, late as it was, saw my headlights as I went by. But I was moving fast, Jerry. I was working off a grouch. I needed speed. Where did you go? Straight down the peninsula on the main highway to Palo Alto, made the sweep across to the sea, and then up the coast road. I ran into the garage about dawn. No stops anywhere? He shook his head. And that's your alibi? That's my alibi. Worth looked at me a long while before he said, finally, Don't you see, Jerry, that the other side had all this before they encouraged Bowman to change his mind about when father was shot? I did see it. Ought to have known from the first. This is what they had back of them last night in Cummings' room. This explained the lawyer's smug self-confidence, Dykeman's violent certainty that Worth was a criminal. A realization of this had whitened Barbara's face, set her lips in that pitiful, straight line. As to their momentary chagrin over Bowman, no trouble to them to get other physicians to bolster any opinion he'd given. Medical testimony on such a point is notoriously uncertain. All the jury would want to know was that there could be such a possibility. I sat there with bent head and felt myself going to pieces. Cummings was right. I was no fit man to handle this job. My personal feelings were too deeply involved. It was Worth's voice that recalled me. Cheer up, Jerry, old man. Take it to Bob's. Take it to Bob's? 
the idea of a big, husky old police detective running to cast his burden on such shoulders. I couldn't quite do it then. I went and telephoned the little girl that I was doing the best I could, and then ran circles for the rest of the day, chasing one vain hope after another, and finally, in the late afternoon, sneaked home to Santa Isabel. Now I had the road more to myself. Only an occasional handsome car, where the wealthy were getting into the part of the festival they'd cared for. In the orchards near town, where the big picnic places had been laid out with rough board tables and benches, seats for thousands, there were occasional loud basket lunch parties scattered. All at once I was hungry enough to have gone and asked for a handout. I went by back streets down to the house to get my mail. There seemed no human reason that I should feel it a treachery to have worth in jail in San Jose, and be able to walk into his house at Santa Isabel a free man. The place was empty. Chung had the day off, of course. It was possible Worth's cook, even, didn't know what had happened to his employer. Santa Isabel had no morning paper. In the confusion of the Blossom Festival, I venture to guess that not more than a score of people did as yet know of the arrest. Our end of town was drained, quiet. Nobody over at the Vandeman bungalow. Looking down at the square as I made my sneak through, I had caught a glimpse of Bronson Vandeman a great rosette of apricot blossoms on his coat lapel, making his speech a presentation to the cannery girl queen, while his wife, Ina, her fair face shaded doubly by a big flower hat and a blossom-covered parasol, listened and looked on. One of my pieces of mail concerned the Skeels chase. If my men down there had Skeels, and Skeels was Clayt, it would mean everything in handling Cummings and Dykeman. I took out the report and ran hastily through it a formal statement, day-by-day -day stuff. Found skeels and dial at Tijuana, negotiating to buy saloon and gambling house. Arranged with Hefeco for arrest of S. Expense twenty dollars. Rurales took S. to jail. Expense four dollars fifty cents. I interviewed S., and he said he came here to open a business where he could sell booze. D. was his partner in proposition. S. knew nothing of bank affair would waive extradition and come back to stand trial at our expense. Interview D. He says combined capital of two is forty-five hundred dollars, saved from S.'s business and D.'s miners' wages. D. said, Not much to show up with. But there were three photographs enclosed that I wanted to try on Cummings' indictment. No telling where I'd find either, but the Fremont house was my best bet. Getting back there through the crowd, I saw Skeet Thornhill in a corner drugstore waiting at its counter. I was afoot, having been obliged to park my roadster in one of the spaces set apart for this purpose. I noticed Vandeman's car already there. I lingered a minute on that corner looking down the slope that led to City Hall Square. Tent restaurants along the way, sandwiches, hot dogs, coffee, milk, pies, doughnuts. Part way down, a hurdy-gurdy in a tent began to get patronage again. The school children in white dresses with pink bows in their hair had just finished a stunt in the square. They and their elders were streaming our way, headed for the snake charmers, performing dogs and nigger in the tank. In the midst of them, Vandeman and his wife came afoot. He caught sight of me, hailed, and when I joined them, asked quickly, glancing toward the drugstore entrance, Worth come with you? I shook my head. He made that little clucking sound with his tongue that people do when they want to offer sympathy, and find the matter hard to put into words. A seller of toy balloons on the corner, with a lot of noisy youngsters around him, the calash calam of a mechanical piano further down the block, and young Mrs. Vandeman's staccato tone saying, I tell Bron that the only thing worse friends can do is to go on exactly as if nothing had happened. Don't you think so, Mr. Boyne? I agreed mutely. Well, I wish you'd say so to Barbara Wallace. Her voice sharpened. She's certainly acting as though she believed the worst. Now, Ina, Vandeman remonstrated, and I asked uncomfortably, What's Barbara done? Where is she? Up at Mrs. Capehart's, in her room. Doesn't come out at all. Isn't going to the ball tonight. Skeet said she refused to speak to Mr. Cummings. Is that all Skeet said? Vandeman, you've told your wife that Cummings swore to the complaint? Yes, but, um, there's no animus. The executor of Gilbert's estate, with all the talk going around, if Worth's proved innocent, he might in the end be glad of Cummings' action. 
Oh, might he! Skeet Thornhill had hurried out from the drugstore, a package of medicine in her hand. Her eyes looked as though she'd been crying. They flashed a hostile glance over the new brother-in-law, excellently groomed, the big flower favor on his coat, the tall, beautiful sister, all frilly white and flower festival fashion. If Worth's proved innocent, she flung at them. Bronce Vanneman, you've got a word too many in when you say that. Just a tongue slip, Skeeter, Vanneman apologized. I hope the boy'll come through all right, same as you do. You don't do anything about it the same as I do, Skeet came back. I'd be ashamed to hope for a friend to be cleared of a charge like that. If I could know he was clear, clear all the time, I'd try to forget about it. See here, Skeet. Ina obviously restrained herself. That's what we're all trying to do for Worth. Forget about it. Make nothing of it. Act exactly as if it had never happened. You ought to come on out to the ball with the other girls. You're just staying away because Barbara Wallace is. I'm not. Some damn fool went and told Mother about Worth being arrested, and made her a lot worse. She's almost crazy. I'd be afraid to leave her alone with old Jane. You get me and this medicine up home. Or shall I go around to Capehart's and have Barbie drive me?" "'I'll take you, Skeeter,' Vanneman said. "'We're through here. We're for home and to dress, then to the country club, and not leave it again till morning. That ball out there has got to be made the biggest thing Santa Isabel ever saw, regardless. Come on.' The crowd swallowed them up. Making for the Fremont house, I passed Dr. Bowman's stairway, and on impulse turned, ran up. I found the doctor packing, very snappish, very sorry for himself. He was leaving next day for a position in the state hospital for the insane at Sefton. His kind have to blow off to somebody. I was it, though he must have known I had no sympathy to offer. The hangover of last night's drunk made emotional the tone in which he said, After all, a man's wife makes or breaks him. Mine's broken me. I could have had a fine position at the Mountain View Sanitarium well paid, among cultured people, if she'd held up her damn divorce suit a little longer. And as it is, you have to put up with what Cummings can land you with such a pull as he has. I'm not complaining of Cummings, sullenly. He did the best he could for me, I suppose, on such short notice. But a man of my class is practically wasted in a place of the sort. I had learned what I wanted. I carried more ammunition to the interview before me. I found Dykeman in his room, propped up in bed, wheezing with an attack of asthma. A sick man is either more merciful than usual, or more unmerciful. Apparently, it took Dykeman the former way. He accepted me eagerly, and had me call Cummings from the adjoining room. The lawyer was half into that costume he had brought from San Francisco. He came quite modern as to the legs and feet, but thoroughly ancient in a shirt of mail around the arms and chest carrying a Roman helmet in his hand as though it had been an opera hat. "'Trying him on?' Dykeman whispered at him. Cummings nodded with that self-conscious, half-tickled, half-sheepish air that men display when it comes to costume. His greeting to me was cool, but not surly. What had happened might go as all in the day's work between detective and lawyer. "'Just seen Bowman,' was my first pass at them. I gather he's not very well pleased with the position you got him. Seems to think it's small pay for a dirty job. What's this? What's this? croaked Dykeman. You been getting a place for Bowman Cummings? Certainly. The lawyer dodged with a swift, practical neatness. I promised him my influence in the matter some little time ago. Yes, I said. Mighty little time ago, the day he promised the testimony you wanted in the Gilbert case. Anything in what Boyne says, Cummings? Dykeman asked anxiously. You know I wouldn't stand for that sort of stuff. The lawyer shook his head, but I didn't believe it was ended between them. Dykeman was the devil to hang on to a point. This would come up again after I was gone. Meantime, I made haste to shove the photographs before them. Cummings passed them back with an indifferent, What's the idea? You don't recognize him? Never saw the man in my life and again he asked, "'What's the idea?' "'You'd recognize a picture of Clate?' I countered with a question of my own. "'Yes, I think so,' rather dubiously. "'But Dykeman would. Show them to him.' 
Dykeman reached for the photographs, spread them out before him, then looked up from them peevishly to say, "'For the good Lord's sake, don't look any more like Clate than it does like a horned toad. Is that what you've been wasting your time over, Boyne? If you ask me—' "'I don't ask you anything,' retrieving the pictures, planting them deep in an inner pocket. Then I got myself out of the room. Standing on the sidewalk in front of the Fremont house, I felt sort of bewildered. This last crack had taken all the pep I had left. I suddenly realized it was long after dinner-time, and I'd had no dinner, no lunch, nothing to eat since an early breakfast. Worth had sent me to the girl, and I hadn't gone. I dragged myself around to Capehart's cottage as nearly whipped as I ever was in my life. I found Barbara with Laura Bowman, everyone else off the place, out at the shows. Those girls sure were good to me. They fed me and didn't ask questions till I was ready to talk. Nothing to be said, really, except that I'd failed. I told them of meeting with the Vandermans, and gave them Ida Vandermans opinion as to how Worth's friends should conduct themselves just now. So they'll all be out there, I concluded, Vandeman and his wife leading the grand march, her sisters as maids of honor, except Skeet, staying at home with her mother. Cummings goes as a Roman soldier. Dr. Bowman is a Spanish cavalier. Edwards didn't see it as the Vandermans do, but after I talked to him a while he agreed to be there. And suddenly I noticed for the first time how the relative position of these two women had shifted. Laura Bowman wasn't red-headed for nothing. Out from under the blight of Bowman and that hateful marriage, she had already thrown off some of her physical frailness. The nervous tension showed itself now in energy. She was moving swiftly about, putting to rights after my meal while she listened, but Barbara sat looking straight ahead of her. I knew she was seeing streets full of carnival, every friend and acquaintance out at a ball, and Worth in a murderer's cell. It wouldn't do. I jumped to my feet with a brisk, "'Girl, where's your hat? We'll go to the study and look over all our points once more. Get busy, get busy. That's the medicine for you.' She gave me a miserable look and a negative shake of the head, but I still urged, "'Worth sent me to you. The last thing he said was, "'Take it to Bob's.' Dumbly she submitted. Mrs. Bowman came running with the girl's hat and, "'What about me, Mr. Boyne? Isn't there something I can do?' "'I wish you'd go to the country club, to the ball, the same as all the others. Got a costume here, haven't you?' "'Yes, I can wear Barbara's.' She glanced to where a pile of soft black stuff, a red scarf, a scarlet poppy wreath lay on a chair. She was to have gone as the Lady of Dreams. Barbara went with me out into the flare of carnival illumination that paled the afterglow of a gorgeous sunset. No cars allowed on these downtown streets. Even walking, we found it best to take the long way round. To our left the town roared and racketed as though it was a fire. Nothing said between us till I grumbled out, I wish I knew where Cummings was keeping Eddie Hughes." Barbara's voice beside me answered unexpectedly. "'Here, in Santa Isabel. Eddie was at Cape Hearts fifteen minutes before you got there. He came for Bill. A gasoline engine at the City Hall had broken down.' I pulled up short for a moment and looked back at the town. "'Where'd he go?' "'With Bill, to the City Hall. Eddie's one of the Queen's guards. They're all to be at the country club at ten o'clock to review the grand march that opens the ball." I mustn't let her dwell on that. I hurried on once more, and neither of us spoke again till I unlocked the study door, snapped on the lights, brought out and put on the table the 1920 diary and the little blue blotter, the last bits of evidence that I felt hadn't been thoroughly analyzed. Barbara just dropped into a chair and looked from them to me helplessly. You've read this all, carefully?" she sighed. It shook me. To have Barbara, the girl I'd seen get meanings and facts from a written page with a mere flirt of a glance, ask me that. What I really wanted from her was an inspection of the book and blotter, and a deduction from it. As though she guessed, she answered with a sort of wail, "'I can't. I can't even remember what I did see when I looked at these before. I can't remember.' I went and knelt on the hearth with a pretext of laying a fire there, since the shut-up room was chill. And when I glanced stealthily over my shoulder she had gone to work. Not as I had ever seen her before, 
but fumbling at the leaves, hesitating, turning to finger the blotter, setting her lips desperately like an overdriven schoolchild, but keeping right on. I spun out my fire building to leave her to herself. Little noises of her moving there at the table, rustle and flutter of the leaves, now and again a long sobbing breath. At last something like a groan caused me to turn my head and see her, with face pale as death, eyes staring across into mine. It was Clayt, Edward Clayt, who killed Mr. Gilbert here, in this room. The hair on the back of my neck stirred. I thought the girl had gone mad. As I ran over to the table and looked at what was under her hand, it came again. He did, he did. It was Clayt, the Wonder Man. Do, do you deduce that, Barbara? Did I? She raised to mind the face of a sick child. I must have. See, it's here on the blotter. Y-T-E, that's Clayt. Double L-E-R, that's Teller. Avenue is part of Van S. Avenue Bank. Oh, yes, I deduced it, I suppose. Both crimes end in a locked room and a perfect alibi. But, but, don't you see, if it is true, and it is, it is, we're worse off than we were before. We've the Wonder Man against us. Barbara, I cried, Barbara, come out of it. See, you don't believe in me any more. And her head went down on the table. I let her cry while I sat and thought. The broken sentences she'd sobbed out to me began to fit like a puzzle game. By all theories of good detective work, I should have seen from the first the similarity of these crimes. But Clayt, slipping in here to do this murder? And why? What mixed him up with affairs here? And then the icy pang. Dykeman had seen a connection. Cummings had found one. With them it was Clayt and his gang, and his gang was worth Gilbert. I went and touched Barbara on the shoulder. I'm going to take you home now. Yes, tears running down her face as she stumbled to her feet. I'm a failure. I can't do anything for Worth. I wiped her cheeks with my own handkerchief and let her out. As I turned from locking the door, it seemed to me I saw something move in the shrubbery. I asked Barbara Wallace about it. She hadn't noticed anything. Barbara Wallace hadn't noticed anything. I began to be scared for her. Solemn in the sky above boomed out the town clock, two strokes, half past nine. I must get this poor child home. We were getting in toward the noise and the light when I felt her shiver and stopped to say, Did I forget your coat? Why, where's your hat? The hat's back there. I had no coat. It doesn't make any difference. Come on. I can't. Can't. I must get home. I looked at her, saw she was about at the end of her strength, and decided quickly. We'll go straight through the square, save time and steps. She offered no objection, and we started in where the bands played for the street dances, amid the raucous tooting of a thousand fish horns, the clangor of cowbells, and the occasional snap of the forbidden firecracker. As we turned from Broad Street into Main, I found that the congestion was greater even than I had supposed. Here, several blocks away from the city hall, progress was so difficult that I took Barbara back a block to get the street that paralleled Main. This we could navigate slowly. Here also everybody was massed. Confetti flew, serpentines unreeled themselves out through the air, duster spluttered in faces, and among the pierrettes, perros, columbines, sombreroed cowboys, bandanaed cowgirls, Indians, sambos, topsies, and poppy maidens, Barbara's little white linen slip and soft white sweater and my gray business suit were more conspicuous than would have been the Akund of Swat and his captive slave. Even after the confetti had sprinkled her black hair until it reminded me of Skeet's blossom wreath, infinitely multiplied, I still saw the glances through the eye-holes of masks follow us wonderingly. Opposite the city hall, where we must cross to get to the Capehart Street, we were again almost stopped by the dense crowd. The square was a green-turfed dancing floor. From its stand an orchestra jazzed out the latest and dizziest of dances, and countless couples once stepped on the grass, on the asphalt of the streets, even over the lawns of adjacent houses, tree-trunks and flower-beds adding more things to be dodged. At one corner, where the crowd was thick, 
we saw a big man being wound to a pole by paper serpentines. Yelling and capering, the masked dancers milled around and around him, winding the gay ribbons while others with confetti and the Spanish cascarones tried to snow him under. As we came up, a big fist wagged and Bill Capehart's voice roared, "'Hold on! Too much is a-plenty!' He tore himself loose, streaming with paper strips, bent and filled his fist with the confetti at his feet. His tormentors howled and dropped back as much as they could for the hemming crowd. He rushed them, heaving paper ammunition in a hailstorm, and reached us in two or three jumps. "'Golly!' he roared. "'Me for a cyclone cellar! This is a riot! You ain't in costume, either. Wonder they wouldn't pick on you!' With the words they did. I put Barbara behind me and was conscious only of a blinding snow of paper flakes, the punch and slap of dusters in an uproar of horns and bells. "'Good deal like fighting a swarm of bees in your shirt-tail with a willow switch,' old Bill panted at my shoulder. "'Gosh!' as the snapping of firecrackers let loose beneath our feet. "'Some of these mosquito-net skirts will get a fire next. Then they'll be hell a-popping.' Close at hand there was a louder report, as of a giant cracker, and at that Barbara sagged against me. I whirled and put an arm about her. Bill grabbed her from me and lifted her above the pressure of the crowd. I charged ahead, shouting, "'Gangway! Let us through!' Willing enough, the mob could not make room for passage until my shoulder, lowered to strike at the breast, forced away that closed in the instant Bill gained through. It was football tactics, with me bucking the line, Bill carrying the ball. Fortunately, the bunch was a good-natured festival gathering, or my rough work might have brought us trouble. As it was, a short, stiff struggle took us to the outer fringe of the mob. "'How is she? What happened?' I grunted, coming to a stop. "'Search me!' Bill twisted around to look at the white face that lay back on his shoulder, with closed lids. Three strokes chimed from the city hall tower. Barbara's eyes flashed open. As the last stroke trembled in the air, Barbara's voice came, sharp with breathless urgence. "'A quarter of ten! Quick, get me to the country club!' "'Take you there? Now, do you mean?' I ejaculated and holding her like a baby, Bill's eyes flared into mine. "'Did something happen to you back there, girl? Or did you just faint?' "'Never mind about me. There!' That glance of hers that saw everything indicated a parking place packed with machines half a block away up a side street. "'Carry me there. Take one of those cars. Get me to the country club. Don't—' As I opened my mouth, "'Don't ask questions!' I turned and ran. Bill galloped behind. Barbara had lifted her head to cry after me, "'The best one! Pick the fastest!' I plunged down the line of cars, looking for a good machine and one with whose drive I was familiar. The guard rushed up to stop me. I showed him my badge, leaped into the front seat of a speed-built tarpon, and had it out by the time Bill came up with the girl in his arms. I turned and swung open the tonneau door. Almost with one movement he lifted her in and climbed after. I started off with braying horn, and at that I had to use caution. Making my way toward the corner of the street that led to Bill's house, I felt a small hand clutch the slack of my coat between the shoulders, and Barbara's voice, faint but with a fury of determination in it, demanded, "'Where are you going? I said the country club!' "'All right, I'll go. I'll look after whatever you want out there when I've got you home.' "'Oh, oh!' she moaned. Won't you, this one time, take orders?" I went on past the corner. She had a right to put it just that way. I gave the tarpon all I dared in town streets. "'What time is it?' I heard her whispering to Bill. Eight minutes to ten. I have to be there by ten, or it's no use. Can we make it? Do you think we can make it?' "'Yes,' I growled, crouching behind the wheel. "'I'll make it may have to kill a few, but I'll get you there." By this we come out on the open highway, better but not too clear either. There followed seven minutes of ripping through the night of people who ran yelling to get out of our way and hurled curses behind us, only a few cars meeting us like the whirling of comets in terrifying glimpses as we shot past, and at last the country club, strings of gay lanterns, winking ruby taillights of machines parked in front of it, the glare from its windows, and the strains of the orchestra in its ballroom playing on the beach at Waikiki. 
When she heard it, Barbara thanked God with, We're in time. I took that machine up to the front steps over space never intended for automobiles, at a pace not proper for lawns or even roads, and only halted when I was half across the walk. Bill rolled from the tonneau door and stood by it. I jumped down and came around. Lift me out and put me on my feet, Barbara ordered. Help me, one on each side. I can walk. I must. We crossed a deserted porch. The evening's opening event, the Grand March, had drawn everyone, servants and all, inside. So far, without challenge, meeting no one. We had the place to ourselves till we stood, the three of us alone, before the upper entrance of the assembly room. In there the last strains of Waikiki died away. I looked to Barbara. She was in command. Her words back there in town had settled that for me. "'What do we do now?' I asked. White as the linen she wore, the girl's face shone with some inner fire of passionate resolution. I saw this, too, in the determined, almost desperate energy with which she held herself erect, one clenched hand pressed hard against her side. "'Take me in there, Mr. Boyne. And you, to Capehart, find a man you can trust to guard each door of the ballroom. What you say goes. Big Bill wheeled like a well-trained cart horse and had taken a step or two when she called after him, Arrest anyone who attempts to enter. Arrest them if they try to get in, Capehart repeated stoically. Sure, that goes. But I interrupted, You mean if they try to get out? At that she gave me a look. No time or breath to waste. Bill, unquestioningly, had hurried to his part of the work. I took up mine with, Forgive me, Barbara, I'll not make that mistake again. Slipped my arm under hers to support her, dragged open the big doors, shoved past the hallman there, and we stepped into the many-colored, moving brilliance of the ballroom. End of chapter 27《Chapter 28 of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • The Million Dollar Suitcase • Chapter 28 • The Country Club Ball • The ballroom of the Country Club at Santa Isabel is big and finely proportioned. I don't know if anything of the sort could have registered with me at the moment, but I remembered afterward my impression of the great hall fairly walled and roofed with fruit blossoms, and the gorgeousness of hundreds of costumes. The mere presence of potential funds raises the importance of an event. The prune kings and apricot barons down there, with their wives and daughters in real brocades, satins and velvets, with genuine jewels flashing over them, represented so much in the way of substantial wealth that it seemed to steady the whole fantastic scene. Barbara and I entered on the level of the slightly raised orchestra stand and only half a dozen paces from it. Nobody noticed us much. We came in right on the turn of things, floor managers darting around, orchestra with bows poised and horns at lips, the whole glittering company of maskers being made ready to weave their figure of eight across the dancing floor. My poor girl dragged on my arm. Her small feet scuffed. I lifted her along, wishing I might pick her up and carry her, as Bill had done. I made for an unoccupied musician's bench, but once there she only leaned against it, not letting go her hold on me, and stood to take in every detail of the confused, moving scene. The double doors had swung closed behind us, the hallman there who held the knob, now reinforced by a uniformed policeman. The servant's way at the further end was shut. Men in plain clothes set their backs against it. And last, Big Bill himself in overalls, a touch of blunt blue realism came fogging along the sidewall to swing into place the great wooden bar that secured the entire group of glass doors which gave on the porch. Barbara would have seen all these arrangements while I was getting ready for my first glance, but I prompted her nervously with a low-toned, All set, girl. And then, as she still didn't speak, Bill's got every door guarded. She nodded. The length of the room away, in the end gallery, was the cannery girl queen and her guard. Even at that distance I recognized Eddie Hughes, in his pink-and-white beef-eater togs, a gilded wooden spear in his hand, 
a flower tassel bobbing beside that long, drab, knobby countenance of his. There he was, the man I jailed for Thomas Gilbert's murder. Below on the dancing floor were the two, Cummings and Bowman, who had put Worth behind the bars for the same crime. At my side was the pale, silent girl who declared that Clayt was the murderer. Whispered tuning and trying of instruments up here, flutter and rush about down on the dancing floor, and Barbara, that clenched left hand of her still pressing in hard against her side, facing what problem? Crash! Boom! We were so close the music fairly deafened us, as with a multiplied undernote of moving feet the march began. On came those people toward us, wave behind wave of color and magnificence, dotted with little black ovals of masks pierced by gleaming eye-holes. I could sense Barbara reading the room as it bore down on her, and reading it clearly, getting whatever it was she had come there for. Myself, I was overwhelmed, drowned in the size and sweep of everything, struggling along, whispering to her when I spotted Jim Edwards in his friar's robe, noticed that the Roman soldier who must be Cummings, and Bowman the Spaniard, squired the Thornhill twins in their geisha girl dresses. The crimson poppies of a lady of dreams looked odd against Laura Bowman's coppery hair. At the head of the procession as they swung around, leading it with splendid dignity, came a pair who might have been Emperor and Empress of China, the Vandemans. To go on with affairs as if nothing had happened, though Worth Gilbert was in jail, had been the laid-down policy of both Vandeman and his wife. I thought it reasonable then, foolish to get hot at it now. The great, shining, rhythmically moving line deployed, interwove, and opened out again until at last the floor was almost evenly occupied with the many-colored mass. I looked at Barbara. The awful intensity with which she read her room hurt me. It had nothing to do with that flirt of a glance she always gave a printed page, that mere toss of attention she was apt to offer a problem. The child was in anguish, whether merely the ache of sorrow or actual bodily pain. I saw how rigidly that small fist still pressed against the knitted wool of her sweater, how her lip was drawn in and bitten. Her physical weakness contrasted strangely with the clean-cut decision, the absolute certainty of her mental power. She raised her face and looked straight up into mine. Have the music stopped. I leaned over and down toward the orchestra leader to catch his eye, holding toward him the badge. His glance caught it, and I told him what we wanted. He nodded. For an instant the music flooded on, then, at a sharp rap of the baton, broke off in mid-motion, as though some great singing thing had caught his breath. And all the swaying life and color on the floor stopped as suddenly. Barbara had picked the moment that brought Ina Vandeman and her husband squarely facing us. After the first instant's bewilderment, Vandeman and his floor managers couldn't fail to realize that they were being held up by an outsider. With Barbara in full sight up here by the orchestra, they must know who was doing it. I wondered not to have Vandeman in my hair already, but he and his consort stood in dignified silence. It was his committee who came after me, a Mephistopheles, a troubadour, an Indian brave, a Hercules with his club, swarming up the step, wanting to know if I was the man responsible, why the devil I had done it, who the devil I thought I was, anyhow. Others were close behind. "'Edwards,' I called to the brown friar, "'can you keep these fellows off me for a minute?' Still not a word from Barbara. Nothing from Vandeman. Less than nothing. I watched in astonishment how the gorgeous leader stopped dumb, while those next to him backed into the couple behind, sidestepping, so that the whole line yawned, swayed, and began to fall into disorder. "'Cummings,' as I glimpsed the lawyer's chain mail and purple feather, "'keep them all in place if you can. All!' In the instant, from behind my shoulder, Barbara spoke. "'Have that man take off his mask.' A little shaking white hand pointed at the leader. "'Mr. Vanneman,' I said, "'that's an order. It'll have to be done.' The words froze everything. Hardly a sound or movement in the great crowded room, except the little rustle as someone tried to see better. And there, all eyes on him, Bronson Vanneman stood with his arms at his sides, mute as a fish. Ina fumbled nervously at the cord of her own mask, calling to me in a fierce undertone, 
What do you mean, Mr. Boyne, bringing that girl here to spoil things? This is spite work. Off. Take his mask off. Do it yourself. Barbara's voice was clear and steady. I made three big jumps of the space between us and the leading couple. Vanneman's committeemen obstructed me, the excited yip going amongst them. Vanneman! Brats! Vanny! Who let this fool in here? Do we throw him out? Then they took the words from Edwards. The tune changed to grumblings of, What's the matter with Van? Why doesn't he settle it one way or another and be done? Why didn't he? I had but a breath of time to wonder at that as I shoved a way through. Darn him, like a graven image there, the only mute, immovable thing in that turmoil. I began to feel sore. You heard what she said. I took no trouble now to be civil. She wants your mask off. No flicker of response from the man, but the Empress of China dragged down her mask, crying, Heard what she said? What she wants? Over the shoulders of the crowd she gave Barbara Wallace a venomous look, then came at me. A little too late. My hand had shot out and snatched the mask from the face of China's monarch. A moment I glared, the bit of black stuff in my grasp, at the alien countenance I had uncovered. Crowding and craning of the others to see, jabbering, exclaiming all around us. Corking makeup! Looks like a sure enough Chinaman! No makeup at all! The real thing! What's a big idea? Why did he unmask then? Didn't want to. They made him. And last but loudest, repeated time and again, with wonder, with distaste, with rising anger, the Vandeman's Chinese cook! For with the ripping away of that black oval I had looked into the slant, inscrutable eyes of Fong Ling. Hemmed in by the crowd, he could but face me. He did so with a kind of unhuman passivity. And the committee went wild. Their own masks came off on the run. I saw Cummings' face, Bowman's. Eddie Hughes slid from the balcony stair and bucked the crowd, pushing through to the seat of war. The grand march had become a jostling, gabbling chaos. Barbara, up there, above it all, knew what she was about. I had utter confidence in her. But she was plainly holding back for a further development, her eyes on the entrances. And what the devil was my next move? Ina Vanneman wheeled where she stood and faced the room, both hands thrown up, laughing. It was meant to be a joke, a great big foolish joke, her high treble rang out. Bronze here somewhere. Wait, he'll tell you better than I could. At a masquerade, people do, they do foolish things, they— Is Bronze Vanneman here? I questioned Fong Ling. The Chinaman's stiff lips moved for the first time in his formal, precise English. Yes, sir, Mr. Vanneman will explain. He crossed his hands and resigned the matter to his employer. And I demanded of Ina Vanneman. You tell us your husband's present, in this room, now? And when her answer was drowned in the noise I roared, Vanderman! Bronson Vanderman! You're wanted here! No answer. Edwards took up the call after me. The committee yelled the name in all keys and variations. In the middle of our squawking a minor disturbance broke out across by the porch entrance, where big Bill Capehart stood. As I looked, he turned over his post to Eddie Hughes, who came abreast of him at the moment, and started, scuffling and struggling toward us, with a captive. "'I had my orders,' his big voice boomed out. "'Pinch any one that tried to get in. You don't pass me, not if you was own cousin to God Almighty.' On they came through the crowd, all mixed up, blue overalls and a flapping costume whose rich, many-colored silk embroideries flashed like jewels. A space widened about us for them. The big garage man spun his catch to the center of it so that he faced the room, his back to the orchestra. What it in, did you? Now you're in. What about it? What about it, indeed? In Bill's prisoner, as he stood there twitching ineffectually against that obstinate hold, breathing loud, shakily settling his clothes, we had, robe for robe, cap for cap, a duplicate Emperor of China and the next moment this figure took off its mask and showed the face of Bronson Vanderman. Dead silence all about us. Capehart loosened his grip, abashed but still truculent. 
Dang it all, Vanneman, if you didn't want to get mussed up, what made you fight like that? Fight? Vanneman found his voice. Who wouldn't? I was late, and you... Braun! After one desperate glance toward the girl up on the platform, Ina ran to him and put a hand on his arm. They stopped the march. You're... the... they spoiled our joke. But have them start the music again. You're here now. Let's go on with the march. Explain afterward. Good business. Vanneman filled his chest, glanced across at Fong Ling, and gave his social circle a rather poor version of the usual white-toothed smile. "'Jokes can wait, especially busted ones. On with the dance. Let joy be unrefined!' Sidelong, I saw the orchestra leader's baton go up, but no music followed. It was at Barbara the baton had pointed, at Barbara that all the crowded company stared. Her little white dress clung to her slender figure. I saw that now she was in the strange Buddha pose. A few flecks of silver paper, still in her black hair, made it sparkle. But it was Barbara's eyes that held us all spellbound. In her colorless face those wonderful openings of black light seemed to look through and beyond us. For an instant there was no stir. Hundreds of faces set toward her, held by the wonder of her. Fong Ling's yellow visage moved for the first time from its immobility with a sort of awe, a dread, and when my gaze came back to her I noticed that, with the dropping of her hands to join the fingertips, she had left where that little pressing fist had been a blur of red on the white sweater. Over me it rushed with a force of calamity. She had been wounded when she sank down back there in the crowd. It was a shot, not a giant cracker we had heard. Vanderman. I whirled on him. You shot this girl! You tried to kill her! Sensation enough among the others, but I doubt if he even heard me. His gaze had found Barbara. All the bounce, all the jauntiness was out of the man, as he stared with the same haunted fear his eyes had held when she concentrated last night at his own dinner-table. She was concentrating now. Could she stand the strain of it, with its weakening of the heart action? It's pumping all the blood to the brain. I shouldered my way to her and knelt beside her, begging, Don't, Barbara. Give it up, girl. You can't stand this. Her hands unclasped. Her eyes grew normal. She relaxed, sighingly. I leaned closer while she whispered to me the last addition in that problem of two and two, the full solution. Armed, I faced Vanneman once more. Something seemed to be giving way in the man. His lips were almost as pale as his face, and that had been, from the moment he uncovered it, like tallow. He looked withered, smaller. His hair, where it had been pressed down by mask and cap, crossed his forehead, flat, smooth, dull brown. I saw, half-consciously, that Fong Ling was gone. An accomplice? No matter. The criminal himself was here, Barbara's wonder man. It was to him I spoke. Edward Clayt. At the name, Cummings clanked around front to stare. I hold a warrant for your arrest for the theft of nine hundred and eighty-seven thousand dollars from the Van Ness Avenue Savings Bank of San Francisco. He made a sick effort to square his shoulders, fumbled with his hair to toss it back from its straight-down sleekness as Clayt to the pompadoured crest of Vanderman. How often I had seen that gesture, not understanding its significance. Cummings, at my side, drew in a breath with, "'Why, damn it, he is Clayt!' "'All right,' I let the words go from the corner of my mouth at the lawyer, in the same hushed tones he'd used. "'See how you like this next one,' and finished, loud enough so all might hear. "'And I charge you, Edward Clayt, Bronson Vanderman, with the murder of Thomas Gilbert!' End of chapter 28《Chapter 29 of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase, Chapter 29 Unmasked. Disgrace was in the air. The country club had seen its vice president in handcuffs. There was a great gathering up of petticoats and raising of moral umbrellas to keep clear of the dirty splashings. 
it made me think of a certain social occasion in Israel some thousands of years ago, when Absalom, at his own party, put a wrong one over on his brother Amnon, and all the rest of King David's sons looked at each other with jaws sagging, and every man gat himself up upon his mule and fled. Here it was limousines. More than one noble chariot, filled with members of the faction who'd helped to rush Vanneman into office over the claims of older members, rolled discredited down the drive. Yet a ball is the hardest thing in the world to kill. Like a lizard, if you break it in two, the head and tail go right on wriggling independently. Also, behind this massed affair at the country club was the business proposition of a lot of Blossom Festival visitors from all over the state who mustn't be disappointed. By the time I'd finished out in front, getting my prisoner off to the lockup, sending Eddie Hughes, with Capehart and the other helpers he picked up to guard the Vanderman bungalow, handed over to the Santa Isabel police the matter of finding Fong Ling, and turned back to see how Barbara was getting on, the music sounded once more the rhythmic movement of many feet. "'The boys have got it started again.' Jim Edwards joined me in the hall, his tone still lowered and odd from the amazement of the thing. "'Curious that business in there yesterday,' a nod indicated the little writing-room toward which we moved. "'Braunt stepping in, brisk and cool, for you to question him. Pleasant, ordinary-looking chap. Would you say he had it in his mind right then to murder you, or Barbara, if you came too hot on his trail?" "'Me?' I echoed sheepishly. He never paid me that compliment. He wasn't afraid of me. I think Barbara sealed her own fate, so far as he was concerned, when she let Worth peek her into doing a concentration stunt at Vanema's dinner-table last night. The man saw that nothing she turned that light on could long stay hidden. He must have decided then to put her out of the way. As for his wife, well, however much or little she knew, she'd not defend Barbara Wallace. At that Edwards gave me a look, but all he said was, "'Cummings has suffered a complete change of heart, it seems. I left him in the telephone booth just now, calling up Dykeman. He'll certainly keep the wires hot for worth.' "'He'd better,' I agreed and only Edward's slight, dark smile answered me. "'There's a side entrance here,' he explained mildly as we came to the turn of the hall. "'I'll unlock it, and when Barbara's ready to be taken home we can get her out without everyone gaping at her.' He was still at the lock, his back to me, when a door up front slammed, and a Spanish cavalier came bustling down the corridor, pulling off a mask to show me Bowman's face, announcing, "'I think you want me in there.' That girl should have competent medical attention. She has that already, I spoke over my shoulder. And if she hadn't, do you think she'd let you touch her bowman? Man, you've got no human feeling. If you had a shred, you'd know that to her it is as true you tried to take Worth's life with your lying testimony as it is that Vanneman murdered Worth's father with a gun. Ha! the doctor panted at me. He was fairly sober, but still a bit thick in the wits. "'You people ain't classing me with this crook Vanneman, are you? You can't do that. No, of course. Loris set you all against me.' Edward straightened up from the door. With his first look at that fierce, dark face, the doctor began to back off, finally scuttling around the turn into the main hall at what was little less than a run. They had Barbara sitting in the big Morris chair while they finished adjusting bandages and garments. Our young cub of a doctor, silver-buttoned velveteen coat off, sleeves rolled up, hailed us cheerily. That bullet went where it could get the most blood for the least harm, I'd say. Have her all right in a jiffy. At that, if it had been a little further to one side. And I knew that Edward Clayt's bullet, Bronson and Vanderman's, had narrowly missed Barbara's heart. This wonderful girl, the doctor went on with young enthusiasm as he bandaged and pinned. Sitting up there, wounded as she was, and forgetting it, she looked to me more than human, sort of effect as though light came from her. I was ashamed of myself back there in the square, Mr. Boyne, Barbara's voice, good and strong, cut across his panegyric. Never in my life did I feel like that before. My brain wasn't functioning normally at all. I was confused, full of indecision. 
she mentioned that state, so painfully familiar to ordinary humanity, as most people would speak of being raving crazy. It was agonizing. She smiled a little at the others. Poor Mr. Boyne helping me along. We got somehow into a crowd, and I was just a lump of flesh. I hardly knew where we were. Then suddenly came the sound of the shot, the stinging, burning feeling in my side. It knocked my body down, but my mind came clear. I could use it. I'll say you could, I smiled. From then on, Bill Capehart and I were the lumps of flesh that you heaved around without explanation. There wasn't time, and I was afraid you'd find out what had happened to me and wouldn't bring me here," she said simply. I knew that the one motive for silencing me was the work I'd been doing for Mr. Boyne. Sure, I said, light breaking on me. And every possible suspect in the Gilbert murder case was under this roof, or supposed to be. The Grand March would be the showdown as to that, and just then the clock struck. Poor girl! It was a race against time, Barbara agreed. If we could get there first, hold the door against whoever came flying to get in, we'd have the one who shot me. But, Barbara, child, Laura Bowman was working at a sweater sleeve on the bandaged side, you did get here and caught Bronson Vandeman. It had worked out all right. Why did you risk sitting up in that strained pose, wounded as you were, to concentrate? For Worth. I had to relate this crime to the one for which he'd been arrested. Within the hour I'd gathered facts that showed me Edward Clayt killed Worth's father. When I brought that man and his crime to stand before me, and Bronson Vandeman and his crime to stand beside it, as I can bring things when I concentrate on them, I found they dovetailed. The impossible was true. These two were one man." She looked around at the four of us, wondering at her, and finished, "'Can't they take me home now, doctor?' "'Sit and rest a few minutes. Have the door open,' the young fellow said. And on the instant there came a call from me from the side entrance. "'Mr. Boyne, are you in there? May I speak to you, please?' It was Skeet Thornhill's voice. I went out into the entry. There, climbing down from the old Ford truck, leaving its engine running, was Skeet herself. Her glance went first to the door I closed behind me. Yes, I answered its question. She's in there. Then, moved by the frank misery of her eyes, she'll be all right, very little hurt. She said something under her breath. I thought it was, thank God, looked about the deserted side entrance seemed to listen to the flooding of music and movement from the ballroom, then lifting to mine a face so pale that its freckle stood out on it, faltered a step closer, and studied me. "'They phoned us,' scarcely above a whisper. "'Mother sent me for the girls and Ina. Mr. Boyne,' a break in her voice, "'am I going to be able to take Ina back with me, or is she—do they—' "'Wait,' I said. "'Here she comes now.' as Cummings brought young Mrs. Vanneman toward us. She moved haughtily, head up, a magnificent evening wrap thrown over her costume, and saw her sister without surprise. Skeet, she crossed and stood with her back to me, there's been some trouble here. Keep it from mother if you can. I'm leaving, but we'll get it all fixed up. How did you get here? Can I take it back in the limousine? The big closed car, one of Vanneman's wedding gifts to her, purred slowly up the side drive, circling Skeet's old truck, and stopped a little beyond. Skeet gave it one glance, then reached a twitching hand to catch on the big silken sleeve. You can't go to the bungalow, Ina. As I came past, they were placing men around it to... to watch it. What? Ina wheeled on us, looking from one to the other. Mr. Boyne, Mr. Cummings, who had that done? Does it matter? I countered. She made me tired. Does it matter? She snapped up my words. Am I to be treated as if, as though? Even Ina Vandeman's effrontery wouldn't carry her to a finish on that. I completed it for her explicitly. Mrs. Vandeman, whether you are detained as an accomplice or merely a material witness, I'm responsible for you. I would have the authority to allow you to go with your sister, but you'll not be permitted to even enter the bungalow. It's nearly midnight, she protested. I have no clothes but this costume. 
I must go home. Oh, come on, Skeet pleaded. Don't you see that doesn't do any good, Ina? You can get something at our house to wear. She gave me a long look, her chin still high, her eyes hard and unreadable. Then, for the present, I shall go to a hotel. She laid a hand on Skeet's shoulder, but it was only to push her away. Tell mother, evenly, that I'll not bring my trouble into her house. Oh, you want Ernestine and Cora? Well, get them and go." And with a firm step she walked to her car. I nodded to Cummings. "'Have one of Dykeman's men pick her up and hang tight,' I said, and he smiled back understandingly with, "'Already done, Boyne. I want to speak to Miss Wallace, if I may. Will you please see for me?' A moment later he marched shining and jingling in through a door that he left open behind him, pulled off his Roman helmet as though it had been a hat, and stood unconsciously fumbling that shoe-brush thing they trimmed those ancient lids with. Barbara, he met the eyes of the girl in the chair unflinchingly, you told me last night that the only words I ever could speak to you would be in the way of an apology. Will you hear one now? I'm ready to make it. Talk doesn't count much, but I'm going the limit to put Worth Gilbert's release through." There was a long silence, Barbara looking at him quite unmoved. Behind that steady gaze lay the facts that Worth Gilbert's life and honor had been threatened by this man's course, that she herself was only alive because the bullet of that criminal whom his action unconsciously shielded missed its aim by an inch. Worth's life, her life their love and all that might mean, and Barbara had eyes you could read, I didn't envy Cummings as he faced her. Finally she said quietly, I'll accept your apology, Mr. Cummings, when Worth is free. End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of The Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase Chapter 30 A Confession In the dingy office of the city prison, with its sand boxes and barrel stove, its hacked old desks, dusty books and papers, I watched Bronson Vanderman, and wondered to see how the man I had known played in and out across his face with the man Edward Clayt, whom I had tried to imagine, whom nobody could describe. Helping to recover Clayt's loot for Worth Gilbert looked to the opposition their best bet for squaring themselves. Dykeman, from his sickbed, had dug us up a stenographer. Cummings had climbed out of his tin clothes and come along with us to the jail. They wanted the screws put on, but I intended to handle Vandeman in my own way. I had halted the lawyer on the lockup threshold with, Cummings, I want you to keep still in here. When I'm done with the man, you can question him all you want if he's left anything to be told. I answered a doubtful look. Did you see his face there in the ballroom as he looked up at Barbara Wallace? He thinks that girl knows everything like a supreme being. He's still so shaken that he'd spill out anything, everything. He'll hardly suppose he's telling us anything we don't know. And Vanneman bore out expectations. Now provided with a raincoat to take the place of his mandarin robe his trousers still the lilac satin ones of that costume, he surveyed us and our preparations with a half-smile as we settled our stenographer and took chairs ourselves. "'I look like hell, what?' He spoke fast as a man might with a drink ahead. But it was not alcohol that was loosening his tongue. "'Why can't someone go up to my place and get me a decent suit of clothes? God knows I've plenty there. Closets full of them.' "'Time enough when the sheriff gets here.' Roll Winchell, the town marshal, grunted at him. I'm not taking any chances on you, Mr. Vanneman. You'll do me as you are. Stick a smoke in my face, Cummings, came next in a voice that twanged like a stretched string. Damn these bracelets! Light it, can't you? Light it! He puffed eagerly, got to his feet, and began walking up and down the room, glancing at us from time to time, raising the manacled hands grotesquely to his cigar, drawing in a breath as though to speak then shaking his head, grinning a little, and walking on. I knew the mood. The moment was coming when he must talk. 
The necessity to reel out the whole thing to whomever would listen was on him like a sneeze. It's always so at this stage of the game. For all the hullabaloo in the streets, we were quiet enough here, since the lockup at Santa Isabel lurks demurely, as such places are apt to do, in the rear of the building whose garbage can it is. Our pacing captive could keep silent no longer. Shooting a sidelong glance at me, he broke out, I'm not a common crook, Boyne, even if I do come of a family of them, and my father's in Sing Sing. I put him there. They'd not have caught him without. He was an educated man, never worked anything but big stuff. At that, what was the best he could do, or any of them? Make a haul, and all they got out of it was a spell of easy money that they only had the chance to spend while they were dodging arrest. Sooner or later every one of them I knew got put away for a longer or shorter term. Growing up like that, getting my education in the public schools daytimes, and having a finish put on at nights with the gang, I decided that I was going to be, not honest, but the hundredth man, the thousandth man, who can pull off a big thing and neither have to hide nor go to prison." This was promising, a little different from the ordinary brag. I signaled inconspicuously to our stenographer to keep right on the job. When I was twenty-four years old, I saw my chance to shake the gang and try out my own idea. Clayt rattled it off feelinglessly. It was a lone hand for me. My father had made a stake by a forgery, checks on the city bank. I knew where the money was hid, eight thousand and seventy-nine dollars. It would just about do me. I framed the old man. I told you he is in Sing Sing now, took my working capital and came out here to the coast. That money had to make me rich for life, respected, comfortable. I figured that my game was as safe as dummy whist. Yeah, said Roll Winchell, the marshal, gloomily. Them high-toned eastern crooks always coming out here thinking they'd find the coast a soft snap. Two years I worked as a messenger for the San Francisco Trust Company. Clayt's voice ran right on past Winchell's interruption. A model employee, straight as they come then decided they were too big for me to tackle, and used their recommendation to get a clerk's job with the Van S. Avenue concern. I was after the theft of at least a half million dollars, with a perfect alibi, and the smaller institution suited my plan. It took me four years to work up to paying teller, but I wasn't hurrying things. I was using my capital now to build that perfect alibi." He glanced around nervously as the stenographer turned a leaf, then went on. I'd picked out this town for the home of the man I was going to be. It suited me, because it was on a branch line of the railway hardly used at all by men whose business was in the city, and off the main highway of automobile travel. Besides, I liked the place. I've always liked it." "'Sure flattered,' came the growl as Winchell stirred in his chair. My bungalow and grounds cost me four thousand. At that it was a run-down place, and I got it cheap. The mahogany, old family pieces that I was supposed to bring in from the East, came high. Yet maybe you'd be surprised how the idea took with me. I used to scrimp and save off my salary at the bank to buy things for the place, to keep up the right scale of living for Bronson Vanderman, traveling agent for Eastern manufacturers, not a home much in Santa Isabel yet, but a man of fine family, rich prospects, and all sorts of good fellow, settled in the place for the rest of his days. He turned suddenly and grinned at me. You swallowed it whole, Boyne, when you walked into my house last night, the old family furniture I bought in Los Angeles, the second-hand library, that family portrait, with a ring on my finger, and the same painted in on what was supposed to be my father's hand. Sure, I nodded amiably, you had me fooled. And without a bit of crude make-up or disguise, he rubbed it in. It was a change of manner and psychology for mine. As Edward Clayt, and that's not my name either, any more than Vanderman, I was description-proof. I meant to be, and I was. It took her, the girl, his face darkened and he jerked at his cigar, to deduce that a non-entity who could get away with nearly a million dollars and leave no trail was some man. I raised my head with a start and stared at the man in his raincoat and lilac silk pantaloons. That's so. I fed it to him. She had a name for you. She called you the Wonder Man. Did she? A pleased smile. Well, I'll give her right on that. 
I was some little wonder man. Listen. His insistent, overstimulated voice went eagerly on. The beauty of my scheme was that up to the very last move there was nothing criminal in my leading this double life. You see, as I got stronger and stronger here in Santa Isabel, I bought a good machine, a speedster, that could burn up the road. Many's the stag supper I've had with the boys there in my bungalow, and been back behind the wicket as Edward Clayt in the Vanus Avenue bank on time next morning. I was in that room at the St. Dunstan about as much as a fellow's in his front hall. I walked through it to Henry J. Brundage's room at the Nugget. I stayed there more often than I did at the St. Dunstan, unless I came on here. I'd left marriage out. Then, that night four years ago, when Ina had her little run-in with old Tom Gilbert and got her engagement to Worth smashed, I saw there might be girls right in the class I was trying to break into that would be possible for a man like me. The date for our wedding was set, when Thomas Gilbert remarked to me one afternoon, as we were coming off the golf links together, that he was buying a block of Vanus Savings Bank stock. For a minute I felt like caving in his head then and there with a the golf club I carried. What a hell of a thing to happen, right at the last this way! Ten chances to one I'd have this man to silence, but it must be done right. Not much room for murder in so full a career as mine, holding down a teller's job, running for the vice-presidency of the country club, getting married in style. But every time I'd look up from behind my teller's grill and see anyone near the size of old Gilbert walk in the front door, it gave me the shivers. I'd put more than eight years of planning and hard work into this scheme and you'll admit, Boyne, that what I had was some alibi. A wedding like that in a town of this size makes a big noise. I managed to be back and forth so much that people got the idea I was hardly out of Santa Isabel. The Friday night before I had a stag supper at my house, and Saturday morning, if anyone had called, Fong Ling would have told them I was sleeping late and couldn't be disturbed. On the forenoon of my wedding day, then, I sat as Edward Clayt in my teller's cage, the suitcase I had carried back and forth empty for so many Saturdays, now loaded with currency and securities, not one of which was traceable, and whose amount I believe would run close to a million. It was within three minutes of closing time when someone rapped on the counter at my wicket, and I looked straight up into the face of old Tom Gilbert. I saw a flash of doubtful recognition in his eyes, but didn't dare to avoid them while counting bills and silver to pay his check. If I had done so, he would certainly have known me. As it was, I saw that I convinced him, almost. I watched him as he went out, saw him hesitate a little at the door of Knapp's office. He wasn't quite sure enough. I knew the man. The instant he made certain, he would act. The old devil wasn't on terms to attend the reception at the Thornhill place, but I located him in an aisle seat, when I first came from the vestry with my best man. All through the ceremony I felt his eyes boring into my back. When I finally faced him, as Ina and I walked out, man and wife, I knew he recognized me and almost expected him to step out and denounce me. But no, a fellow leading a double life was all he saw in it. Bigamy was the worst he'd suspect of me at the moment. He didn't give Ina much, wouldn't lift a finger to defend her. Meantime, the manner of his taking off lay easy to my hand. I'd studied the situation through that skylight, seen Ed Hughes juggle the bolts with his magnets, and mapped the thing out. Gilbert killed there, the room found bolted, was a cinch for suicide. When the reception at the Thornhill house was over, I made an excuse of something needed for the journey and started across to my bungalow. It was common for all of us to cross through the lawns. I hid in the shrubbery. There were people with Gilbert, no chance for me to do anything. I stood there and nearly went out of my hide with impatience over the delays while he had his row with Worth, when Laura Bowman and Jim Edwards came and braced him to let up on his persecution of them. Mrs. Bowman finally left. He went with her toward the front. Now was my chance. I dodged into the study, jerked his own pistol from the holster, squeezed myself in behind the open door, and waited. He came back. I let him get into the room, passed me a little, and when at some sound I made he turned, the muzzle of the gun was shoved against his chest and fired. I'd barely finished pressing Gilbert's fingers around the pistol butt when I heard a cry outside, jumped to the door, shut and bolted it, just as my mother-in-law ran in across the lawns. 
I gathered that she'd been there earlier to get those three leaves out of the diary that you were so interested in, Boyne. Had just read them and come back to have it out with old Tom. She hung around for five minutes, I should say, beating on the door, calling, asking if anything was wrong. My one big mistake in the study was that diary of 1920. It lay open on the desk where he'd been writing. It did tell of his having identified me as Clate. I'd not expected it, and so I didn't handle it well. Time pressed. I couldn't carry it with me. I tore out the leaf, stuck the book in the drainpipe, and ran. And, after all, he summed up, my plans would have gone through on schedule. You never could have touched me with your clumsy police detective methods if it hadn't been for the girl. He dropped his head and stood brooding a moment, demanded another smoke, got it, shrugged off some thought with a gesture, and finished. I was in too deep to turn. It was her life or mine. Things went contrary. We couldn't get her to come out to the masquerade, where it would have been easy. With those two Mandarin costumes, Fong Ling in my place, I had my time from the hour we put on the masks till midnight. Another perfect alibi. It didn't work. They say you have to shoot a witch with a silver bullet. And she's more than human." A siren's dry shriek as the sheriff's gasoline buggy made its way through the crowded street outside. Cummings raised his brows at me, got my nod of permission, and shot his first question at the prisoner. Vandeman, where's the money? Not within a hundred miles of here. Instantly. You took it south with you, on your wedding trip? Cummings would persist. But our man, so expansive a moment ago, had, as I knew he would at direct mention of his loot, turned sullen, and he started for the San Jose jail, mum as an oyster. End of chapter 30「Chapter Thirty One of the Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Million Dollar Suitcase. Chapter Thirty One. The Million Dollar Suitcase. The sheriff had gone with his prisoner. Cummings left, and then there came to me in the street there before the lockup, riding with Jim Edwards in his roadster, a Worth Gilbert I had never known. Quiet he had been before, but never considerate like this. When I rushed up to him with my triumph and congratulations, and he put them aside, it was with a curious gentleness. Yes, yes, Jerry, I know. Vanneman turned out to be Clate. Then, noticing my bewilderment, you see, Jim let it slip that Barbara's hurt. Where is she? And Edwards leaned around to explain. When we came past Cape Hearts and she wasn't there, I— Oh, that's only a scratch, I hurried to assure the boy. Barbara'll be all right. So Jim said. He agreed soberly. I'm afraid you're both lying to me. All right, I climbed in beside him. We'll go and see. She's up at your house, waiting for you. As we headed away for the other end of town, he spoke again, half interrogatively. Vandeman shot her? And when I nodded, He's on his way to jail. I'm out. But I'm the man that's responsible for what's happened to her. Dragged her into this thing in the first place. She hated those concentrating stunts, and I set her to do one at that woman's table. To help play my game, I risked her life. I listened in wonder, sidelong in the dimness. I studied the carriage of head and shoulders. No diminution of power, but a new use of it. This was not the crude boy who would knock everyone's plans to bits for a whim. Worth had found himself, and what a man! "'How does it look for recovering the money, Boyne?' Edwards questioned as we drove along. I plunged into the hottest of that stuff Clate Vanneman had spilled, talked fascinatingly, as I thought for three minutes, and paused to hear Worth say, "'Who's with Barbara at my house?' "'Mrs. Bowman,' I said in despair, and quite right there. We came into Broad Street a little above the Vanneman bungalow, which lay black and silent, the lights of Worth's house showing beyond. As we turned the corner, a man jumped up from the shadow of the hedge where the Vanneman lawn joined the Gilbert place. There was a flash, the report of a gun. Our watchers had flushed someone. I'd barely had time to say so to the others when there was a second sharp crack, 
then the whine of a ricocheting chunk of lead as it zipped from the asphalt to sing over our heads. "'Beat it!' I yelled. "'Stop the car and get to cover!' Edward slowed. A moment Worth hung on the running board, peering in the direction of the sounds. I started to climb out after him. There came another shot from up ahead, and then a shout. As I tumbled to my feet in the dark road, Worth had started away on the jump. And I saw then what I'd missed before, that the man who had burst from the hedge was running zigzag down the open roadway toward us. He was making his legs spin and dodging from side to side as if to duck bullets. Worth headed straight for him, as though it wasn't plain that someone out of sight somewhere was making a target of the runner. Not the kind of a scrap I care for. In a half-light you can't tell friend from foe, but Worth went to it, and what was there to do but follow? I shouted and blew my whistle, hoping our men would hear, heed, and let up shooting. At the moment of my doing so, Worth closed with the man, who dropped something he was carrying, and tackled low, lunging at the boy's knees, aiming I could see to let Worth dive over and scrape up the pavement with his face. No dodging that tackle. It caught Worth square. He even seemed to spring up for the dive. And somehow he carried his opponent with him to soften the fall. They came down together in the middle of the hard road with the shock of a railway collision, rolled over and over like dogs in a scrap, only there wasn't any growling or yelping. It was deadly quiet. Not for an instant could you tell which was which, or whether the whirling, pelting tangle of arms and legs was man, beast, or devil. That's why, even when I got near enough, I didn't dare plant a large, thick-soled boot in the mess. The fight was up to Worth, nothing else for it. Capehart came rolling from the hedge where I had seen the pistols flash. Eddie Hughes, inconceivable in pink puffings, bounded after. Jim Edwards chased up from his car, but all any of us could do was run up and down as the struggle whirled about, and grunt when the blows landed. These sounded like a pile-driver hitting a redwood butt. Out of the melee an arm would jerk, the fist at the end of it would come back to land with a thud on somebody's meat. "'Who the devil is it?' I bellowed at Capehart, as the two grappled a foot, then down, no one knowing who was on top, spinning around in a struggle where neither boots nor knees were barred. "'He sneaked out of the bungalow just now,' Capehart snorted. "'We'd searched the place. Didn't think there was room for a louse to be hid in it. Got by the boys. I stopped him at the hedge and drove him into the open. Now Worth's got him. That is Worth, ain't it? Fights like him. Yes, I said, it's Worth. But in my own mind I wasn't sure whether Worth had the fugitive or the fugitive had Worth. And Jim Edwards muttered anxiously as we skipped and sidestepped along with the fight, That fellow may have a knife or a gun. Not where he can draw, I said, or he'd have used it before now. And Capehart sung out, Sure, leave him go. Worth'll fix him. Edging in too close, I got a kick on the shin from a flying heel, and was dancing around on one foot nursing the other when I heard sounds of distress issued from the tangle in the road. Somebody was getting breath in long, gaspy sighs that broke off in grunts when the thud of blows fell and merged in the harsh nasal of blood violently dislodged from nose and throat. For a while they had been up, and swapping punches face to face, lightning swift. Sounds like boxing, perhaps, but there wasn't any science about it. Faint? Parry? Footwork? Not on your life. Each of these two was trying to slug the other into insensibility, working for any old kind of a knockout. I began to be a little nervous for fear the boy I was bringing home from jail as a peace offering to Barbara might arrive so defaced that she wouldn't recognize him when I saw one dark form pull away, leap back, an arm shoot out like a pistol rod, and with a jar that set my own teeth on edge, connect with the other man's chin. He went down clawing the air, crumpled into a bunch of clothes at the side of the road. "'You wanted the chink, didn't you, Bill?' This was Worth facing Jim Edwards' torch, fumbling for his handkerchief. I heard you, and I thought you wanted him. It's Fong Ling, bawled Capehart. Sure we wanted him, and whatever that was he was carrying. Where is it? Did he drop it? Sort of think he did. Worth was dabbing off his own face with a gingerly respectful touch. I know he dropped some teeth back there in the road. Saw him spit him out. 
Maybe you left it with them. You might go and look." The four of us drifted along the field of battle, Capehart's assistant having taken charge of the unconscious Chinaman, whom he was frisking for weapons. Halfway back to the hedge, Bill stumbled on something, picked it up, and dropped it again with a disgusted grunt. "'Nothing but a China boy's keister,' he said contemptuously. "'Not much to that. Why in blazes did he run so?' "'Because you were shooting him up, I'd say,' Edward suggested. "'No, nah, commence to run before we turn loose on him,' Bill protested. "'Hello!' I had pounced on the unbelievable thing and called to Edwards for his light. "'Worth, here's your eight hundred thousand dollar suitcase!' "'That!' he followed along, dusting himself off, trying out his joints. "'Oh, yes, I left it in my closet and it disappeared. Told you of it at the time, didn't I, Jerry?' "'You did not!' I sputtered, down on my knees, working away at the catches. "'You never told me anything that would be of any use to us. If this thing disappeared, I suppose Vandeman stole it to get a piece of evidence in the clay case out of the way.' "'Likely,' Worth turned with no further interest and started toward his own gate. "'Hi! Come back here!' I yelled after him. For the lock gave at that moment. There, under the pale circle of the electric torch, lay Clayt Vandeman's loot. "'My gosh!' mumbled Capehart. "'I didn't suppose there was so much money in the known world.' Eddie Hughes, breathing hard, Jim Edwards bending to hold the torch, Capehart stooping, blunt hands spread on knees, goggle-eyed, my own fingers shaking as I dragged out my list and attempted to sort through the stuff, not one of us but felt the thrill of that great fortune tumbled down there in the open road in the empty night. But Worth delayed reluctantly at the edge of the shadows, looking with impatience across his shoulder, eager to be on, to get to Barbara. Yet I wanted that suitcase to go into the house in his hand, wanted him to be able to tell his girl that she'd made him a winner in the gamble and the long chase. Roughly assured that only a few thousands had been used by Vandeman, I stuck the handles into his fist and trailed along after his quick strides. Edwards followed me. Laura Bowman opened the door to us. She stopped Edwards on the porch. And then I saw my children meet. I hadn't met to. But after all, what matter? They didn't know I was on earth. Creation had resolved itself for them into the one man, the one woman. The suitcase thumped unregarded on the floor. She came to him with her hands out. He took them slowly, raised them to his shoulders, and her arms went around his neck. The End of The Million Dollar Suitcase by Alice McGowan